Na dzień dobry Państwu. Chciałbym rozmawiać, chciałbym mówić dzisiaj o syllogizmach, a szczególnie chciałbym przedstawić kilka wyników, które przyjmowałem razem z Larym Mosem z Uniwersytetu w Indiana. Jak Pan Profesor Kusz właśnie powiedział, wygłosię swój referat w języku angielskim za powodów oczywistych. Okay. Um, I, I take it we all know, we all think we know what syllogism is, and syllogisms are very um, simple things, and, and there should be nothing new here. Um, but I hope to convince you that you don't know everything that, about the syllogism, at least. You don't know as much as you maybe thought you know. If I do that, then I will have achieved my objective. Um, okay, so I'll start very simply, indeed. So, by the classical syllogistic, uh, I don't know how to make the, the uh, by the classical syllogistic, I mean the language of the syllogism. I'll call this S, and I mean simply the set of expressions written in blue here. So, we'll take a, 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 an infinite set of elements, and we'll call these things unary atoms. And if P and Q are unary atoms, these things will be formulas of the language S. I'll read them in English, but of course they're just formulas. Every P is a Q, some P is a Q, no P is a Q, some P is not a Q. So it's just a set of expressions. And um, I will call these things P, I'll call them atoms, unary atoms, and if a P has a bar over, which we read as not, I'll call it, a, 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 I'll call either P or not P a unary literal. And, of course, this is the language which Aristotle is in unary. Unary, unary one place. One place, one argument. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just with one argument. Um, and the, uh, this is, of course, the language which uh, Aristotle considered in Book Alpha of his prior analytics. That, by the way, is a uh, Roman... You had, you had, does anyone know what Aristotle looked like? That's a Roman copy of, allegedly, of a contemporary allegedly Greek bust of Aristotle. Yeah, uh, as you can see in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. Okay, so nowadays we give a model theoretic semantics uh, for the, the syllogism, and um, it goes as follows. Uh, so if you have a structure, so a structure is simply a set of objects and an assignment uh, to every unary atom of a, uh, of a subset of that set. So if you've got a, a unary atom, like, I don't know, artist, um, the uh, assignment to uh, that unary atom is the set of artists within the, set of, within the domain of quantification. Um, the interpretation of negative literals is just a complement, so the interpretation of not P is the complement of P, and we define truth as expected. Right? So in a structure A, I have something which assigns to every unary atom a set of objects, that is by that atom. Uh, all P's are L's is true if and only if the interpretation of P is contained in the interpretation of L, and some P's are L's is true if and only if the interpretation of P is uh, contained in the interpretation of uh, the, the interpretations of P and L intersect. Uh, right, so uh, I should say, I should make it clear, I think I forgot in my haste, um, I, shall use the, I shall use the letter L to range over literals. So, Literals may be positive or negative atoms. So this may be all P's are Q's or all P's are not Q's. But it's the same. So perfectly well-defined truth conditions for the syllogistic. It's just a fragment of first order logic. So there's nothing surprising. Um, so the, the dual notions of a valid argument and a satisfiable set of formulas are defined as usual. Uh, an argument is valid if every model making all the premises true makes the conclusion true. Set of formulas is satisfiable if there's a model making them all simultaneously true. Straightforward. And uh, under this uh, under this semantics, the familiar English uh, glosses, um, uh, the, the notion of a valid argument reconstructs the intuitive notion of a valid argument in English. So if you have an argument like no beekeeper, no beekeeper is a dentist, every artist is a carpenter, some artist is a beekeeper, uh, it follows that some carpenters uh, uh, and not dentists, if you, if you think about it a little bit. And that simply corresponds to the validity in the mathematical sense of this 
uh, secret, right? All models which make these formulas true in orange make the red formula true. I don't believe there is anyone here who, to whom that is new at all. So this is just a standard semantic reconstruction of the intuitive notion of a valid argument. Right? So, all, so you know how to read these now. Right? All beekeepers are not dentists. In other words, no beekeepers are dentists. All artists are carpenters. Some artists are beekeepers. Therefore, some carpenters are not dentists. Clear? Now, that was the syllogistic language. A syllogism uh, well, is a collection of two premise argument forms. So these are the classical syllogisms, Dari and Ferio, right? Yeah, all P's are Q's, some, P's are, uh, some O's are P's, therefore some O's are Q's, and so on. No P's are Q's, some O's are P's, therefore some P's are not Q's. Standard syllogistic rules. And if you have a collection of these rules, they generate a derivation relation in the obvious way. So here we have uh, an example of a derivation. I have three premises in orange, and I apply a proof rule to get another. Uh, 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 I apply a proof rule to these two to get the conclusion some carpenters are beekeepers, and I apply the proof rule ferio to get a third conclusion. And so you can construct proofs in the standard way. So we have a proof relation. Given a set of synergistic rules, uh, where I have x, I mean a set of rules like this, interpreted in the obvious way, you can uh, define a, a derivation relation, and in fact this derivation shows that from these three premises we have the red conclusion. Again, completely standard. And uh, what you would like to show is that there is a set of rules that is sound and complete. That is, you would like a set of rules, so that you have two completely separate notions, the semantic notion of entailment, and the syntactic notion of derivability. And what we'd like is a set of rules that sound incomplete. Does there exist such a set of rules? Yes. Now, you may say, aha, well, you know, I didn't prove this, because that's been known for ages. I'll come on to that in just a second. There are complications. So here, are, here is an example of a complete rule set. So let's just look at this rule. This is the rule that syllogism Barbara, pretty much, Barbara and Ferry, actually. Uh, all P's are Q's, all Q's are not uh, L's, therefore all P's are L's. It sounds incomplete in the following sense. If a syllogism, if a, uh, a sequence, an argument is valid semantically, then there is a derivation of the conclusion from the premises using those rules, and the other way around. It's, it's, it, it's sound. If there's a derivation, then it's valid. It's complete and sound. So you can just, it's, and the proof is fairly open. Um, oh, there's one rule that, uh, notice that these are basically the traditional syllogisms, plus a few corner cases. So we have some funny rules like all P's are P's, which I would probably never gave, because it would have been silly, but, but you need those for completeness. And here's the, the classic, the medieval rule of reductio ad absurdum. If you have a, a sentence and it's negation, you can, you can infer anything. And the negation of the sentence is understood in the obvious way. The negation of all P's are Q's is some P's are not Q's. So there's a natural notion of negation, so we can give the rules like that. Finite set of rules, sound and complete. Okay? Who proves this? Sound, sound, this sound is non, non contradictory? No. Yes. Soundness means that if you can derive something with the rules, then it is valid semantically. Right. Completeness means if it's valid semantically, you can derive it with the rules. So soundness means that the rules are right. They're correct. If the premises are true, the conclusion is true. So soundness is generally easy to prove, completeness is generally hard to prove. Okay? So sound just means, so we have two notions, remember. We have the semantic notion of validity, if all, uh, so a uh, uh, sequence is valid, if any model making the premises true makes the conclusion true. And we have the syntactic notion of derivability, there exists a derivation of the conclusion from the premises. Soundness and completeness means the two match. Exactly, that's what we want. Okay, and there exists such a set of rules. Now, the first mathematical analysis of the syllogism was carried out, arguably, by uh, Lukasiewicz and his students, Wopetsky. And they actually produced, presented things in, in, the, in, the, in the context of propositional logic. So the Barbara syllogism, all P's accused some. Uh, all those are P's, all P's are Q's, therefore all those are Q's, is presented as a formula in propositional logic. And that was an axiom, 
And Swapetsky and uh, uh, Kashevich and Swapetsky showed that this their axiom system, which basically encoded the rules of Aristotle, um, uh, is, is, is sound and complete. Um, they used a very, very strange method of doing it by modern standards. They have inference rules, rejection rules. Uh, I mean, one could give a whole lecture on how they did it. This was originally done in 1939. Unfortunately, the manuscript was destroyed when, uh, when, uh, the, when Warsaw was bombed by the Luftwaffe. Uh, but Wukasiewicz survived the war and later rewrote this up in English. Um, and uh, his student, Jerzy Wupetsky, also survived and went on to become uh, a magician. As many of you will know. Um, okay, so now a more modern proof, more, more, more modern systems, not embedded in propositional logic, were later given in the 1970s. So people provided, um, provided soundness and completeness proofs for rule systems looking like those, like the one I've just showed you. Um, uh, and so I've mentioned a few people here. However, all of those proofs use the rule of reductio ad absurdum. They all assume that um, you, can, you can do the following. If from a, um, a set of premises, you have some, 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 have some set of premises, and it includes, so let's say, some premise not far, and you conclude an absurdity. An absurdity is the formula, a formula of the form, some p's are not p's, it can't be true. Then the rule of reductio ad absurdum says that you can then discharge this premise and conclude find the truth from the other premise. Um, and so if I'm, if you can, so this is a stronger proof system. It's not just that you can do, you do direct derivations, you can also do indirect derivations as well. And if you can direct, if you can derive psi from phi indirectly, I'll write it like that. So we have the proof system of indirect derivation with respect to a set of syllogistic rules. That's not quite the same as the whoops, as the system of direct derivation, uh, which, which is which are which is without reductive absurd. Um, Smiley and Corcoran and the people who did these things in the 1970s always assumed that you could have the rule of uh, uh, use indirect derivations. In fact, it's not necessary. You don't need to use indirect derivations at all. With this rule system that I presented, you can just prove directly. Now, why do, I, why do we care? Okay. What happens when you add relations? Now, in the 19th century, people realised that there were formulas, that there were arguments that, that couldn't be handled by the syllogistic because they were essentially relational in character. For example, uh, De Morgan complained that the syllogistic can't handle every man is an animal, therefore he who kills a man kills an animal. It's intrinsically relational. And Aristotle's logic, of course, couldn't handle relations. Bull, uh, William Stanley Jevons, who's known today better as an economist, also worked on uh, extending the syllogism. People realised, this is pre frege and people realised, of course, that, that the syllogism was in some sense inadequate, but couldn't quite handle, because the logical variable was only discovered by Frege, they, really, they couldn't really account for these relational inferences. The Morgan wrote several treatises on relational syllogisms, all of them abortive. Uh, okay, so let's see how we, if we can do it better. So there's already a set of binary atoms, two-place predicates, right? And uh, I'll call the C term is now that's either a unary literal, like artist or non-artist, or one of these expressions. And I'll read them in English. R's every Q. If R is a binary literal, Q is a, 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 a unary uh, literal, a unary, uh, unary atom. R is a binary atom, Q is a unary atom. So I'll we'll have the I'll uh, call them C terms. R's every Q. R's no Q, R's some Q, does not R every Q. In other words, fails to R some Q. Okay, so, okay, so uh, well, the relational syllogistic is then a set of formulas, all P's are C's and some P's are C's, where P ranges over unary atoms and C ranges over these things C term. So, so what do they look like? I mean, that's just a formal definition. What do they really look like? Here are sentences in the relational syllogistic. Some, you can read them very easily. Some artists admire all beekeepers. All beekeepers don't hate some artists. In other words, no beekeepers hate, it, hate every artist. Right? For every beekeeper, there's an artist he doesn't hate. 
Again, this is standard first order logic, it's a fragment of first order logic. You can give a relational semantics, uh, you can give us a standard uh, uh, model theoretic semantics. It's, uh, we have a notion of valid argument. Okay, so here's a, an example of a valid, valid inference. Every artist admires every beekeeper, some beekeeper admires no artist, therefore some beekeeper is not an artist. It takes a while, it takes a little bit of thought to see that, but you can convince yourself. All right, so if anyone wants to ask me, I'll put them really weird. This takes two minutes, right? Okay, um, now also we can define the language. Uh, um, I'm going to uh, um, come to that uh, later. I thought I'd missed something. I might have missed something out. Uh -huh. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I missed out something, so I'm going to, I'm going to go back. Go back to the uh, classical syllogism. Um, you'll see that um, we can also extend it a little bit. We can say, we can write things like every non-artist is a genius. In other words, we can allow negated, uh, negated terms in the, uh, in the subjects. Um, and so Aristotle also mentioned such forms as well in, in one of his books, so he didn't really analyse them in great detail. And again, you can give a sound and complete set of, uh, of proof books. So we can extend the ordinary syllogistic with these negated terms. So we can say things like every non-artist is a genius. Uh, back to the relational syllogistic, you can do the same. We can extend with negated uh, terms. So you can say things like some non-P is every non-Q. And I'll call these uh, extended languages where you can negate uh, nouns. You have to noun level negations. I'll indicate those with a dagger. So you've got S dagger, the ordinary syllogistic extended with negation, R dagger, the relational syllogistic extended with negation. So all languages have negation in some sense, but, but these dagger languages allow you to negate at the level of nouns. So you can say some non-artists are, are not being used. You can't say that in the Okay, so we've got what, what, are our, what are our languages? The classical syllogistic. The extended classical syllogistic, so you can negate nouns, the relational syllogistic, and the extended relational syllogistic, where you can negate nouns. Every, each one of those languages is a fragment of first order logic. It has a finite number of sentence forms, standard semantics, and uh, we can ask about uh, sound and complete proof systems. So here's a question. Can we write a sound and complete proof system for the relational syllogistic or even the extended relational syllogistic? Well, here are some candidate rules. So if you, you might have the following rule. Um, every P stands in relation T to every O. Some O is a Q. Therefore, every P stands in relation T to some Q. It's going to be valid. OK. <coughs> can, can, can we just give a finite list of these rules, which is sound and complete? The answer is no. With the relational syllogistic, there is no finite set of rules in that language such that the, der that the direct derivation in relation is sound and complete. Now, remember I mentioned reductio ad absurdum. Sometimes you have these indirect proofs with reductio ad absurdum. And with the classical syllogistic, you do not need them. But with the relational syllogistic, you do. In the relational syllogistic, there is a set of rules. So there's a set of rules, I call the rules script, uh, yeah. I don't know, sensory so, There's a set of rules R such that the indirect derivation relation with respect to those rules is sound and complete. If a, form, if a sequence is valid, you can derive it, but you may have to, you may have to do, use indirect reasoning. So it's quite surprising. With the uh, ordinary syllogistic, it doesn't, uh, uh, reductio ad absurdum is not necessary. With the relational syllogistic, it is. What about the extended relational syllogistic. That's the language in which you can say things like every non-artist admires some non-beekeeper. That's not sure why you'd want to say that, but suppose you do. Theorem. There is no finite set of rules in this language such that the direct, such that the derivation relation with respect to that set of rules is sound and complete, even when you allow reductio ad absurdum. It's a bit of a surprise. Relational, the ordinary syllogistic, simple. Extended syllogistic, again, simple. But with the relational syllogistic, you need uh, a more, at least a more complicated proof, uh, pr a proof uh, mechanism. And with the extended relational syllogistic, you can't do it. No sound complete system. 
So uh, let's return to De Morgan's example, just to show you the kinds of things you can do. Um, so De Morgan's example was every man uh, is an animal, therefore he who kills a man kills an animal. Well, let's define the language R star where you can have, you can say, you can take arbitrary C terms like something which kills an animal, something, you know, something which admires every beekeeper. One of those kinds of terms. And uh, so we can say, we can now uh, say uh, all C's are these and some C's are these. So you can say this, every man is an animal, therefore everything which is such that he, ki that he kills a man is such that he kills an animal. Yeah? So exactly what the Morgan said. Theorem. There is, a, there is a finite set of rules such that uh, it's sounding complete, but again, you need reductio ad absurdum. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated. With the ordinary relational syllogistic, you need reductio ad absurdum, but you only ever need to apply it once at the very end. With this language, you may need to apply it even an exponential number of times. Actually, this, that language was studied in the artificial intelligence literature, essentially this language, and it was shown to be NP time complete. Uh, so, uh, so it, it turns out that, and it turns out that the NP time hardness means that you have to apply reductio ad absurdum in general a lot of times, because otherwise you would, uh, unless of course P equals NP, which is. So, if you don't know about complexity theory, don't worry. But this this language was studied uh, in the artificial intelligence literature. So that's uh, that's the situation with relational syllogisms. Um, so we have the classical syllogistic, we have a direct proof system, extend it, doesn't, I mean, you can add man-level negation, remember dagger means you can talk about non-artists, non beekeepers same, relational syllogistic, uh, it's, it's sound and refutation complete, you need to apply uh, uh, reductio ad absurdum once, and uh, with, with the extended relational syllogistic, it's, um, there is no sound of completion system, even with the direct rules, and with R star you get sound of complete, but you need to introduce that to observe and R star dagger, it's hopeless. Uh, I, I didn't talk about that. I want to finish, um, we started a little late. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. so um, I want to finish with um, numbers. Right? So I talked about extending the syllogism with, with binary relations. Uh, okay, this is so uh, we're staying within first order logic, right? The syllogistic with binary relations is still in first order logic. Um, and uh, all these systems are defined. But what happens when we have numbers? Okay, so let's look at the ordinary syllogistic. I'll, I'll reorder it slightly. No P is a Q, some P is a Q, every P is a Q, some P is not a Q. And I'll rewrite them using numerical quantities. So no P is a Q is at most zero P is a Q. Every P is a Q is at most zero P's are not Q's. Some P is a Q is at most uh, zero P's are Q's. More, uh, uh, some P is not a Q means more than zero P's are not Q's. And now I'm going to replace zero by any integer. Uh, so here's a, 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 an argument. So here's a test to see what you're made of. At least 13 artists are beekeepers. At most three beekeepers are carpenters. At most four gardeners are not carpenters. Um, yes, any guesses? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, uh, you'll, you'll see in a moment why that's an unfair question. Well, uh, there are 13 artists, at most three of them are carpenters, if they're, so at most three of these 13 can be carpenters. Uh, if they are, take them out, shoot them, that leaves 10 people. At uh, most four of the, they're all non carpenters, uh, so at most four of them, the rest can be gardeners. If there are, if there are any other gardeners, take them out, shoot them, and that leaves uh, at least six people. And so six artists are not right. So, uh, okay, you get the idea. So we can generalize the syllogism with numbers as well. Um, and let n be the, so that's what I said. So let n be the language with formulas of the following form. There are at most i p's which are l's. There, there are at least i, there are more than i p's which are l's. And that's all you need. And of course, you can, you can generalize it by having noun negation. So you can say there are at most, at most three non non P's are Q's, things like that. But the three non P's are non Q's. So you get a slightly larger language, N and then DAG. DAG just means you can have an application. Now, De Morgan uh, made a, a good attempt at giving syllogisms for, for, for this numerical syllogistic. The numerical syllogistic is just an extension of the ordinary syllogistic. And he suggested rules like this. At most M O's are P's, 
at most n p's are not cubes, therefore at most n plus n o's are not cubes. When you think about it, that, that doesn't make sense, by the way. And so he suggested some rules like that, and his rules don't work. Theorem, uh, there exists no finite set of syllogistic rules in either, of the in either the language n, just the ordinary numerical syllogistic, or the language n dagger, where you can negate nouns, it's not the same thing different, such that the, that, that the uh, derivation relation is sound and complete. You can't do what Aristotle did in the numerical syllogistic. It's impossible. Okay? So I, I'm not giving proofs here, but proof. Okay. Um, I want to, um, I want to uh, round up uh, fairly uh, soon, because this is just a sort of summary. What are we doing here? We're, we're, we're taking logic began with the syllogism, I suppose, and um, the syllogism is linguistically very natural. Right? All A's are B's, some A's are B's, some A's are B's. These are natural sentences. And logic remained closely related to natural language really until Frege developed the notion of a logical variable, and then we started being able to, then we, we acquired the ability to take a sentence like every boy loves some girl and translate that into for all X and X is a boy, there exists Y, then that Y is a girl and X loves Y. Before Frege, we couldn't do that. Once that transition had been made, logic separated from natural language very much. Well, I think it's worth going back to fragments of natural language to look at what logic we get and look at what the proof theoretic, model theoretic, and complexity theoretic properties are. I mentioned Jevons, and Jevons, and I also mentioned that De Morgan's rules cannot work. He could not have succeeded in getting a sound and complete system. But Jevons had a better approach. He said, give me you suppose we've got unary atoms, properties of individuals, one place proteins. We can form state descriptions. That is, something has P1 or doesn't have it, something has P2 or doesn't have it. So the state <coughs> description is just a complete description of a possible individual using the properties P1 and P8. And we can list those, and there are exponentially many of them. Now we can write integer variables. WK, so, so if the state descriptions are sigma 1 to sigma 2 to the n, for uh, state description sigma k, we can write an integer variable, WK. So that a constraint of the form, uh, there are at most C, P's, which are L's, just translates as the sum of all the variables WK, such that the corresponding state description satisfies P and L is less than C. So we can translate... Set, so, so we can translate the constraints in the, in the numerical syllogistic into um, linear constraints on variables, where the variables represent the number of things satisfying the various possible state descriptions. And we can solve those systems of linear equations. Okay? So, and, and of course, the computational complexity of the procedures for solving systems of linear equations is known. It is known that the, the, linear, the integer linear programming problem is solvable in NP time. And from this, you can show that the satisfiability problem for the numerical syllogistic, indeed for the, new, in, in, for the uh, extended numerical syllogistic, it's the same, is NP complete. By the way, that's not trivial. NP hardness is easy to show. Membership in NP time, for those of you who know complexity, is by no means true. Okay, so, uh, we, uh, so what we can do is solve that. I mean, there's no problem about the decidability of these uh, logical systems. Uh, but, of course, there isn't a system of rules in the Aristotelian sense. We can show that no such rules. Uh, no such set of rules can be sounded in people. I need to wrap up now, so let me just advertise a general program. Take some naturally delineated fragment of, lo uh, of natural language, as it might be, oh, sentences, as it might be the fragment up, right? So you can say things like, every, every boy loves some girl, no artist admires every beekeeper. Question, can we axiomatize that system using a certain sorts of proof systems. Question, can we decide validity within the given fragment? Question, if we can decide it, what's the computational complexity of doing so? And it turns out you can carry out this enterprise for a whole uh, series of fragments of natural language. I've just given you a little taster, starting with the syllogism, uh, but of course you can, you can do many more things as well. You might ask, for example, what happens when you add uh, relative clauses? Every artist who admires some beekeeper hates them. Etc. Et I'll just finish with one thing. 
Uh, what happens if you write numbers <coughs> and relations? Uh huh. Tricky, right? Um, uh, well, it, the answer is that those six artists are carpenters. And uh, it's not, I'm not surprised you didn't get it. That, that system, where you have both relations and numbers in the fragment, is NX time complete. It's a very complex system, even with that simple fragment of English. I'll stop at that point. Thank you for your attention.